Okay, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 to 23. Uh, we have covered 1 to 14 in two weeks, and today we hope to finish chapter 1. As we say, Ephesians is the a letter from the heart of God in which he wants to communicate to us that he is able to do more than we can ask or imagine. God has a plan for our life in such a way that he is capable of doing or willing to do more than what we can think or imagine. Because when you begin to imagine, when you begin to think, then you ask. When you ask, God begins to answer your prayer. And that is why he said he is able to do more than we can ask or imagine. And in that same way, today Paul is still in chapter 1 with that he's, when he is writing this letter, you have to imagine him to be standing before the church and be full of excitement. He is so excited, he wants to say so many things to the Ephesian church. He wants to write so many things to the Ephesian church. And therefore, last week it was a long one sentence. And this is today another one long sentence in which he is praying for the people of Ephesus or the members, wherever he remembers. And in that prayer, we see a heart of a pastor for the believers. So today's title is Heart of a Pastor for the Believers, for the members of his church. Why does one become a pastor when he or she is standing before the pulpit, when he or she takes the place or the position of a pastor, what is in that person's heart? What motivates this person to become a pastor? What inspires this person to continue to do what he or she is doing? That we will see from today's passage from Paul's prayer for the Ephesians. So let's go to the text from chapter 1 verse 15 to 23. Follow with me as we read. Let us read together. 1, 2, 3. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realm, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. That's a long sentence once again, how Paul is filled with the joy of the Lord. Now you have to imagine he is writing this letter from a prison. He doesn't know whether he will be released or not. What will be his state? And the Roman prison wasn't a comfortable place. It's a miserable place, especially for an old man now. Yet when he thinks about the believers, in the previous statement, he was filled with the praise for the glory of God. He would say everything for the praise of the glory of the grace of God, for the praise of God, for the praise of God. And now he began to pray for the Ephesians. Even when he is praying, he is filled with this awesome excitement of God's glory and grace and his mercy for the believers. So that's how he is rolling and rolling and rolling when he is writing the scroll from the Roman prison for the believers in Ephesus or wherever they may be. And this letter is actually not so sure whether he exactly wrote to the Ephesians or it was meant to be from Ephesus to Colossae to Philippi to all these places. He would ask them to send these letters, to read these letters as the believers continue to exchange their place of leadership in his absence. So therefore, this is Paul's heart for the believers. This 
reflects what he is feeling and what he is having in his heart about the believers. So the first thing we see is Paul's heart is filled with thanksgiving and remembrance. Paul is full of memory. Next slide, please. He is filled with thankfulness. His heart is full of thankfulness every time he remembers the believers in Ephesus, every time he remembers the believers in Colossae, every time he remembers the believers in Thessalonica or Philippi or all different places. He is full of the thanksgiving to God. And he said, he said, for this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayer. Thankfulness. When he sees the work of God in the life of a believer, he looks at himself and sees nothing so special. And he looks at the believers in spite of the suffering, in spite of the difficulty, they are full of faith in God and they are full of love for one another. Even though he is in prison, he is gone. He was worried about them. But whenever he hears about their faith in Christ, whenever he hears about their love for one another, he is filled with thankfulness to God. Say, Lord, you used me, a man like me. I was the enemy of the cross. I was the enemy of God. I have done unimaginable things against your church but today you use me I am so grateful for using me to begin a church like this I'm so grateful to bring the gospel to these people so that today they are filled with faith in you they are a faithful believer they are filled with such an amazing faith in you they are able to withstand Roman persecution. They are able to withstand suffering in life. They are able to withstand persecution of all kind and loss of all kind in life. He is filled with thankfulness to God because of the faithfulness of the believers. And secondly, he is filled with thankfulness to God because of the love for one another. The Ephesian believers, the Philippian believers, the Colossians believers, they were loving one another. They were a loving community. They would sacrifice everything they have in order to help someone else. In 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 8 and 9, if we read these two chapters, he explains the nature of these believers. That how out of your extreme poverty, there welled up within you a deep sense of generosity and you gave out of your poverty so much beyond what I could ask or imagine for the people in Jerusalem. These believers were filled with love and generosity. So much so, some of the members from Colossae, some of the members from Philippi, when they heard Paul was in prison, they collected offering out of their poverty and they sent the people to Rome to minister to Paul. These were genuine believers, full of love of God for themselves, for God, for one another. Faith and love. And one more element is going to come. He would say, these three things are the lasting things. Faith, hope and love. And he's going to talk about hope also. But first he says, when I see your faith in God, when I see your love for one another, I am so grateful to God. Faithful and loving believers inspire a pastor into the life of prayer and thanksgiving. You want to see the heart, heart of a pastor? When he sees believers who are faithful, when he sees believers who are loving one another, that will compel this man or a woman to fall on his face before God and pray. When a believer comes to a pastor and said, Pastor, God spoke to my heart and this is the offering I bring. It breaks his heart because these some of the members, they, become, they are very poor. One of the learning lessons in my life in Nepal was when we started the church, they were very poor believers. And uh, me and my wife, we worked hard. We taught in three, four Bible schools, translated books so that we could make a living and pay the rent for the house, uh, church and ourselves. And one day a believer came with an offering and said, Pastor, I want to give this to you. And I was kind of uh, so reluctant and I said, no, 
You cannot do this. You, you are very poor. No, no, no. I am fine. Thank you very much. I refused that offering. And God convicted me. He said, you are a proud man. You are an arrogant man. You think you have everything within yourself. That person with sincere gratitude came. Instead of thanking him and praying for that family, you broke that person's heart. I repented from that day onward until today. Every time when a person walks into the church, puts an offering or comes and says, Pastor, I have this, it breaks my heart. And it, it forces me to go into my private room and pray for that person. Faithful believers create this atmosphere of prayer for them. And a loving believer, when, when the pastor sees believers taking care of one another, when there is a one member in difficulty, pastor has no capacity to help, he can only pray, but then the believer go themselves take care of, love one another, demonstrate the loving relationship that drives that pastor back into the prayer room and he begins to pray for the believers. Of course, there are pastors who are in the ministry for the money also. They exploit the believer. That's a different case. I cannot talk about a pastor who is in the ministry for making money. I don't know what kind of reaction that will come. But a genuine man or a woman who is called by God to come into the ministry and when he sees members being faithful to God, when he sees members full of hope and zeal and joy, when he sees members loving one another, loving God, it makes him pray even more. It makes him humble himself before God. It makes him to repent from his selfishness. It makes him to repent from his wickedness and stand before God and say, Lord God Almighty, I am unworthy to be minister of these people. Have mercy upon me. I thank you. You chose a man like me. I thank you. You chose a woman like me to minister to a people like this. Oh God, help me. Oh God, help me. And then he begins to pray for them. That's the heart of a pastor. When he sees believers full of love, full of hope, full of faith, it inspires him to pray and become a grateful man. He doesn't care how much he suffers. He doesn't care what kind of challenges go in life. All a genuine man and a woman of God cares is that his church members are full of love, full of hope, and full of faith. That's the, that's the heart of a pastor. If your pastor is not praying for you, He's not worthy to be a pastor. And I want to conf uh, confess to you that I will pray. I have been praying long before you came. And we left Nepal many years ago. But still, every day, when I bow down before God, those members are... We left Korea many, almost a year ago. I still remember some of those members who go through hard time. I, every time memory comes, I, my heart is broken. I'm not there. Sometimes they send emails saying, Pastor and all. It breaks my heart. I still pray for them. There are lakhs of people who watch my online messages in Nepali and some in English as well. And some of them send me many, many emails that I can't even reply to them. But I remember every time I see, read those emails, even though I cannot write all to all of them, it breaks my heart and I pray for them. It breaks pastor's heart when he sees believers not walking in love, when he sees believers not having faith in God, when believers lose hope and they become so discouraged, it breaks the pastor's heart. He becomes so helpless sometimes. He may preach the message, he may pray, but if the believers are not full of faith, if the believers are not full of love, if the believers are not full of hope, then it becomes a burden. It, it doesn't know what to do. What can I do? But on the other hand, when believers are full of love, faith and hope, he becomes inspired to do great and mighty things. He continues to go on, spend more time in prayer, spend more time in the message, spend two more time in seeking God's kingdom for the welfare of his members. So this is a pastor's heart full of thanksgiving and now he's praying for the church. What is he praying? Let us see in the next verse. What is he praying? Pastor's prayer for the believers. What is he praying? Number one, that they may know God better. Let us read 17 and 18. 17 say, 
I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. This is a cognitive knowledge. This is a mental knowledge. This is an intellectual understanding of God. That they may know God better mentally. That means you may study the Bible. That you may understand who Jesus is. That you may be able to tell people why you believe in Jesus Christ. That you will be able to explain to them who Jesus is. That you will be able to put your faith into words. For that you need wisdom. Spirit of wisdom and revelation. Wisdom may have to do with your personal study. Wisdom may have to do your experience. Wisdom may have to do your uh, reading books. Wisdom may have to do with your uh, studying the Bible or coming to church. But wisdom alone, a human way of learning alone is not enough. But then there comes a need for revelation. That is outside of yourself. From God himself. The Holy Spirit himself has to reveal to us who God is. Then only we can be convinced. So many people, they study about the Bible. They study about God. But they never know God. So Paul is asking God, Lord, give my believer the spirit of wisdom and spirit of revelation. So that they will know you better. As a member of a church, I wish every one of us would know our Bible very well. And every one of us would be able to explain why we believe in Jesus Christ. Some of the basic things about Christian faith, we must be able to explain. That's the knowledge that Paul is wanting the believers in Ephesus to know. God, cognitive knowledge, that is your mental understanding of God. Your intellectual perception of your faith. That will come through wisdom, by study, by experience, and by revelation of God, so that you know Him better. But that is not enough. He is also praying for something else. Next verse tells about that they may experience what God has done for them. So he is praying for two things here, you have to see. Number one, he is praying for their knowledge of God. Number two, he is praying for the experience of God. The word know also is used here, but it is much more to do with experience of God. Knowing not only mentally, but knowing in your heart. So how did he say? Let's read. He said, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, or in some translation, opened. You have eyes in your heart. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. The first part, verse 17, was your understanding of God. When you open the Bible, you read Jesus speaking, or Paul, or Apostle speaking, you begin to comprehend what they are saying. When you stand before God in worship, you, you know how awesome God is, how majestic God is, how great and mighty our God is. You have some idea. That's a cognitive understanding of God. Now he is asking here that your eyes of your heart may be opened so that you may know or experience hope. Your eyes may be opened so that you may see what kind of life he has given to us. Your eyes of the heart may be opened so that you may experience the hope. That's the prayer Paul is praying for the Ephesian believers. If you know God, that when you have the knowledge of God, then the Spirit of God begins to open the eyes of your heart. When your eyes of the heart are opened, then you can see, oh, this is the cross of Jesus Christ. This is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the heaven's glory that I am looking forward. This is the miraculous life that Jesus wanted to give. You begin to see or know or feel in your experience. That's an experiential knowledge of God. You're not only hoping for, I hope after I die, I will go to heaven. I hope maybe next year God will bless me. I hope maybe tomorrow something. No. That means 
I know God is going to bless me today. I know God is going to bless me tomorrow. I know when I die, I will go to heaven. I know right now, I have experienced. Because I have seen with my eyes. Can you imagine? You can see your hope. Hope is something distant. But Paul is saying here, my prayer is that you will not only hope in your mind or heart, that you will be able to see that. That's what in next prayer we will see in chapter 3, verse 20. He said, God is able to give you more than you can ask or imagine. Unless you see your life, you cannot even ask. What kind of life do you see yourself? What are you looking at your life from 5 years, from 10 years now? What do you see yourself? If you see by the Spirit of God, if your spiritual eyes are opened, you will see your life. You can see what kind of life you... You know, there was a time. I was a domestic helper. I was 17 years old, maybe. At about 17, 18, I forgot the exact time. I was washing a pastor's dish and cooking for him and cleaning and I was chopping firewood for him so that I could get a place to stay and a food to eat. And one day, there was a British man visiting that pastor, and I was chopping the wood. And I didn't understand what they were talking at that time. The pastor said to this British man, he is good at chopping woods. I was very curious to know what they were, they were laughing, and they, I was... Full of, in my life until then I had never worked for anyone as a servant but that was the first experience as a servant in someone's house this man said he is good at chopping wood so I didn't understand that what that mean so I went back after the work is done I looked for dictionary he means me is means I understood is good at I could not find chopping also I found Wood also I found. And I made a sense, oh, I'm chopping wood. But what is good at? I could not find what is good at. There was no word good at. Eventually, I started with good. And I realized that means they must be telling I'm good at chopping wood. I understood for all oh, they... Him, I was a terrible cook. I never knew how to cook. I was not a good worker inside the house also. He was never satisfied with my cooking or cleaning. He must have said, he is only good at chopping wood. And I said to myself that day, no, I am not just good at chopping wood. One day, you see, he's talking about a village boy who was abandoned by his parents from the day he was born. And then he's a domestic helper in someone's house. He's chopping a firewood. He doesn't know one word of English in his life. And he's telling to himself, one day I'm going to preach the gospel in this Englishman's language. 17 years old, I think. Once I began to read the Bible in my own language, I saw my future. I saw a distant future. And I said to myself, I'm going to marry a woman who will teach me English. You know, that was my dictionary after. In my life, I never had a dictionary. And nowadays, I have to teach her anyway, but forget about that. What I'm saying is that Paul is asking that believers will see their future. They will see their inheritance. You see that? So that they may experience their inheritance, what God has given to them. What God can do in their life. The future possibilities can become a present reality when your eyes of the heart are opened. So every pastor, a genuine man and a woman of God who has called to ministry, longs that his members will see what God can do in their life. That they will see their future. That they will see what amazing thing God has prepared for them. But many Christians, sad to say, they never, never know what it is to have the eyes of the heart to be opened. If you want to see your eyes of the heart open, like Paul in verse 17, you pray. You pray like this. God, give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Give me so that I will know you better. And then you say, Lord, open the eyes of my heart so that I will know the hope that you have called me for. And the inheritance you have for me. Not only inheritance, then the power. That they may experience the power. A village boy who is chopping a firewood 
but he saw that the possibility in the eyes of God and uh, in the heart of God and then this God gave this village boy the power to overcome his handicaps he gave him the power to marry a woman that he couldn't ever imagine to marry i was so afraid that my wife is going to say no when i asked her two weeks i waited my life was miserable like a hell and she never responded and the lady i sent a message with i told her if you don't tell me i'm going to i'm going to attack you like that she said she is from burma okay sangampa is a word she used to call me i don't know what language is that sangampa wait no wait wait i will bring the message one of my closest friend in the high school during my village life had said to me when i accepted christ and i went and told him the gospel and said no no i don't believe this kind of religion and you are such a hopeless man you know you may be very proud to believe in a foreign religion but to marry you will have to come back to your village you will have to ask your relatives or parents to look for a girl you will never be able to marry that's what his word and some years later when my son was about 6 years old we traveled to our district for making our citizenship and uh, we were it was a ra- rainy evening dingy hotel somewhere in the m- mountain side me my son and my wife we were having dinner together and then the, across the table there was another man he keeps on staring he keeps on staring and i felt so difficult and i went and said excuse me do you want to say something <laughs> and he said i knew it is you but only by your voice i knew but the language was different so i could not i knew you married and we traveled together and he's still a friend so he was surprised that i was able to marry what i'm saying is that a pastor's heart for the believers is that they will have dreams and visions for their life that they will be able to see what god can do in their life and then not only that they know the power of god that they experience the power of god that will bring them to their dream that will make their life worth living joyful living when they become old and their time on earth is done that they will walk into the presence of jesus with head held high and say lord here i come I did it Lord you gave me the call you gave me the dream you gave me the vision you gave me the power you gave me the ability you used me for your glory in the earth here I come Lord and you bow at his feet that's the glorious hope we have so the power what kind of power let's close this passage before I take too long what kind of power next slide please sir what kind of power is this that makes this uh wood chopper a preacher of the gospel today is this the power is the same as the mighty strength he exalted when he raised christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority power and dominion and every name that is invoked not only in the present age but also in the one to come and god placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church which is his body the fullness of him who fills everything in every way so number one this is the same power that raised jesus from the dead it is the resurrection power of jesus you are not an ordinary person a believer in jesus christ has this heaven's power that makes the dead people come out of the grave that's the same power of the holy spirit is given to us and then secondly it is his sovereign power you see paul is going on and on explaining one thing that jesus is sovereign he is god he is the creator he is the master he sustains everything by the power of his word according to hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 he is sovereign he knows what is coming and also he is able to bring that to pass in your life that's the power the sovereign power of god and then lastly the ever present power what he said last verse which is his body he is he is having that power for his church which is the body he the fullness of him who fills everything in every way in some translation to everywhere he fills the church with his presence and power he fills your life with his presence and power jesus said at the end in matthew's gospel he said don't worry i will be with you until the end of ages 
ever-present power. He's always available. He's filling you and I with that divine, amazing power. And that is what Paul is asking the Ephesians believer to believe for, to look forward. He's praying that they will have this knowledge of God. He will praying that they will have this experience of God. He's praying that their eyes will be open. They will see the inheritance they have. He's praying that they will be full of hope. He's praying that God will give them that divine power in their life. Shall we think about that and begin to dream the kind of life God wants to give to us?